So ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back. I'm Mark Purcell from ACFID and I think you'll agree this morning's panellists and speakers have been stellar and spoke with great authority and passion uh, about the issues uh, of development and sustainable development that we're exploring today. This next session is also uh, going to be presented by a panel of great authority. It explores the geostrategic shifts that we're seeing with the rise of China, competition with America, how that plays out in Asia and the Pacific, and what does this mean for a aid program that is now uh, part of the Australian official foreign policy uh, portfolio. We've got uh, our chair, Bridie Rice, who is ACFID's Director of Policy and Advocacy, well known to many of you, that has done a brilliant job in helping ACFID work both with you, our members, but also to be an interlocutor with government, with the policy and advocacy team. She has many years of experience. She's worked uh, for the Australian government in Papua New Guinea in technical assistance. She's also worked uh, internationally for the UN in human rights uh, in Cambodia. We have Anthea Mulikala from the Asia Foundation, where she is Senior Director for International Development Cooperation. She leads the Foundation's work on Asian approaches to development cooperation, focusing on how Asian countries are influencing South-South cooperation and the, global, and the global development landscape. Melissa Connolly Tyler, who is uh, maybe well known to you from her former role as uh, head of the Australian In Institute of International Affairs, but has recently uh, taken up the role as director of Asia Links Diplomacy, and uh, apparently just has been confirmed uh, past her probation uh, in the six months in the role. So congratulations. Um, She's a lawyer and specialist in conflict resolution, including negotiation, mediation, and peace education. You might have heard her with uh, Alan Gingell on uh, uh, Geraldine Dug last Saturday morning. Uh, and the final panelist uh, in this esteemed panel is Richard McGregor, who's a senior fellow at the Lowe Institute and an award-winning journalist and author. Uh, I just finished his little uh, uh, monograph uh, on President Xi, The Backlash, which is uh, a fascinating and incisive uh, account of uh, the Communist Party and how they're operating in China under Xi's leadership, and I really, really recommend it to you. It's a, it's a, it's a really tight read that gives you a lot of insight into what's happening in China in the moment and how that plays out in the world. So please join me in warmly welcoming our panellists, and over to Bridie. Thanks, Mark. Working at the ACFID Secretariat is a privilege. In one breath, we find ourselves rooted firmly in the experiences of you, our members. We advocate for the work you do, the principles that you uphold. We harness the expertise and insights from the field that you gain and march it up the parliamentary hill and through the halls of government to adv advocate for a better development cooperation program on the whole a program that listens, as we have done today, to the interests of the people it claims to serve. And we do this with you proudly. And we advocate for poverty alleviation unashamedly. But working in the Ackford Secretariat provides a different kind of privilege as well. When we march up that hill and through the halls of government, we also listen to different voices. And some days it can feel as though they're speaking a different but important language a language less of empowerment, local ownership and rights, but instead of foreign policy, trade, security, strategic and national interest, geostrategic and economic contestation, and the role of our ODA program as an instrument of foreign policy. And it strikes us then that on the one hand, the clarity of our development cooperation program has never been so plain. The idea that ODA spending has the potential to achieve development outcomes and that in turn, this generates stability and prosperity, is clear. It's ACFID's advocacy mantra. Good development practice generates great development outcomes, and this is in Australia's national interest. 
But on the other hand, perhaps our development cooperation program has never been so chaotic. The 2014 new aid paradigm is ageing and being leapfrogged at rapid pace by big policy initiatives such as the Pacific Step Up and a return to infrastructure financing. Spending on international relations in Australia has dropped from 9% in 1949 to 1.3% today. That's not aid alone. That's a drop in our overall international relations portfolio. At the same time that Defence, ASIO and Secret Intelligence Service have seen increases of some 291%, 528% and 578% respectively since 2001. And so we face a critical opportunity, not just as a development sector, but as part of Australia's international relations community. What does the current geopolitical arena mean for Australia's development cooperation program? And what is the place of development beyond aid as a critical pillar of building regional security for people and our planet? And so the seed was sown for this panel, bringing together leading experts from the diplomatic community domestically and internationally to reflect and debate clarity or chaos, development cooperation in a time of contestation. Each panellist will kick us off in this discussion with a short 10 minute presentation. Richard will start by painting a picture of the geostrategic context we find ourselves in, the chaos, if you will. Melissa will follow by discussing what the opportunities are for the development sector in this context. And Anthea will finish by discussing development cooperation trends globally and the connection between development and diplomacy. The panel will then be invited to answer some questions. So I'd like to call Richard to the mic. Um, thank you, Bridie. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I've been told that the acoustics aren't great. I don't know what the point of the roundhouse was. I thought it was all about acoustics. So I'm told I have to speak slowly. So you might get a five minute speech over 10 minutes. Uh, I'm also not going to speak to you about uh, your business, aid. Uh, I really don't know anything about that. I know that doesn't stop a lot of people giving opinions these days, but I'm gonna stick to my lane as it were. And I'm also going to try, try and focus on East Asia or North Asia as we call it here, big power politics, uh, and bring that back to Australia. Once again, it doesn't really, you mightn't think um, it, it affects your countries or where, what you do directly, but if I could paraphrase uh, what they used to say about the Middle East, you know, the US and China, you might not be interested in the US and China conflict, but the US and China conflict is very interested in you. Um, and so that means that, you know, it's going to be something we all have to deal with one way or another. So let me just get the lens right out and talk about Asia since the Second World War. You know, uh, very succinctly, I think uh, Asia, East Asia in particular, Southeast Asia also, since the war has been, I would argue, an economic success, but a political failure. So what do I mean by that? If you look at the Korean Civil War, South and North Korea, never been solved. If you look at the Chinese Civil War, which is you know, Taipei, Beijing, that's never been solved. If you look at Sino-Japanese tensions, uh, they're you know, abating at the moment, but generally there's a great deal of trust between the region's two giants, China and Japan. So how have we had successive economic miracle after miracle in the region, starting with Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, China, the biggest of all, in Southeast Asia as well. How has that happened with so many big political cleavages still intact? Now, there's many great literature, libraries bulging with books about the East Asian miracle, many reasons for that. Clever bureaucrats, high education, capital controls, uh, protectionism, uh, uh, and the like. Uh, and a, uh, a sort of uh, um, a structuring it so you climb up the ladder of technology, in other words, starting with low wage, low wage industries and you know, climbing your way up as Japan, South Korea, Taiwan and now China is doing. All of those are important, um, but also extremely important is the US, not just as a market. Uh, the reason we have trade problems with the US and Asia these days because the US deliberately opened its market to countries like Japan and South Korea to make them wealthy and make them strong allies. Uh, uh, of course, that doesn't quite work quite so well with China. So it's the US market, but it's also the US military. 
basically, uh, since the war, and I know there are exceptions, the Korean War, the Vietnamese War, the US has provided the security goods to allow all these economies to flourish. And by the way, that includes China for large parts of that time. When the US and China uh, came together in 1972, that was um, uh, against the Soviet Union. You know, the US, people forget this, used to have listening posts inside China to spy on the Soviet Union. And of course, in the 80s, when China started to develop, they didn't invest much in their military because they relied on the US to keep the peace, a stable economic environment. Now, it's pretty obvious to anybody who reads the papers that those days are gone. Um, China, like any big country, wants to be the dominant country in its region. Uh, it certainly will no longer, and hasn't for, I guess, for about 10, 20 years, been willing to rely on the US for its security. Uh, that's a natural position for China to take, and there's also very practical reasons why. Uh, most importantly, oil. Uh, the US these days is a net energy exporter. China has been a net energy importer since 1992. And of course, a lot of that oil comes through the Malacca Straits, which the Chinese know the US Navy could cut, stop, close just like that. So quite naturally, China, for its own security, for its own pride, for all its own reasons, um, wants to have a strong military and a strong Navy uh, of its own. So we get to where we are these days uh, with the US and China. I've often said that they are on a collision course, uh, but in the past they knew they were on a collision course and made sure they didn't actually collide. Uh, now that's changed. It's not just Trump. Trump has sort of had his own impact on things, which I can talk about if you like. Uh, but these days, um, the US is almost, you know, China and the US know they're on a collision course and are heading towards that collision. Um, it's not just military, uh, it's not just trade. Trade might be the one that gets the headlines these days, but trade might be the least of their bilateral problems. Uh, it's geopolitical, uh, it's regional, uh, it's technology. That's why we hear a lot of talk about a digital Cold War these days. That's what the Huawei fight uh, is all about. And not to be underestimated in the US-China competition is ideological competition as well. In other words, these, this is a contest between two very uh, different systems. Now, obviously, this has been accentuated in both countries by their leaderships. Uh, both uh, ambitious um, in their own way, uh, both extremely different leaders. Trump, in Trump, the, with the US has the most ill-disciplined president perhaps ever, certainly in living memory. In China, uh, Xi Jinping is the most disciplined and the most powerful leader uh, for a generation. Uh, the US, we have a kind of system under Trump with all this stuff spilling out into the press every day of kind of radical transparency. Not his tax returns, mind you, but generally radical transparency. In, in China, we have a sort of system of radical opacity. The Communist Party state is secretive by habit under Xi Jinping has become uh, even more so. Um, so, and, and that has simply thrown up, I think, into a stark relief, the dif differences between the two systems um, generally. Now, the big question uh, for China, long term, there's many issues, as you know, there's the demographic decline that's coming, the demographic cliff, et cetera, et cetera. The big question for China, and in fact for the region, and in fact for the world, and for US-China competition, is the Chinese economy. What happens with the economy? Right now, the official growth rate is 6%. Uh, it sounds low if you follow the heady days of 10, 11%, but in fact, it's 6% on a vastly greater base. Um, uh, and if it's real, it's probably less than that. It's very hard to tell because in China, they smooth the statistics out. Uh, if it's less than that, that's fine. China can be fine with four or 5%. It depends on the kind of growth. But if you compare it to other Asian tigers, for example, um, uh, China is declining, its growth is declining at a much faster rate uh, than other comparable countries. In other words, the, oh, only two minutes left. Um, the, you know, will China uh, get old before it gets rich? At the moment, it, it looks like that. Now, I just wanna briefly say, I've been speaking too slowly, if we come back to Australia. Australia-China relations are in the doldrums. They have been for a couple of years. If you think of the n any number of issues which divide us these days, let me, I make a list here. 
drugs and swimmers, Mac Horton, Huawei, the Solomon Islands cable, the Pacific step up generally, Hong Kong and the campus protests, which feeds into the issues of universities and national security uh, issues of uh, research collaboration. South China Sea, Marines in Darwin, Crown Casino, remember that? It's coming back. New South Wales uh, Labor Party donations. Labor, of course, in New South Wales has got the worst of all, all worlds. It's got all the scandals from uh, getting money from certain Chinese businessmen, and of course, fewer and fewer of the Chinese community's votes. I don't know how they get out of that. Uh, there's the trade tensions, allegations that China is holding up uh, a number of our exports. There's hacking, the ANU and the federal parliament, the Uyghurs, the jailed Chinese-Australian writer, Yang Hangzhun, Gladys Liu, that was uh, only a few weeks ago, it's disappeared. So if you think about it, there's an enormous number of points of friction between Australia and China, and that's without even going into the big strategic cleavage about where we sit in the US-China conflict. And people say, oh, we don't have to choose. Obviously, we have chosen. We're a US ally in many respects. We've chosen uh, uh, the US. Uh, and the difficult thing for Australia to do is to, having chosen the US and sticking with the US as a security ally, is to also protect our economic interests at the time, which are obviously substantial. I'll just finish on one point. Uh, uh, I think 40% of Australia's goods exports in July went to China. Um, so are we reliant on China or are we interdependent? Uh, I would like to say we're interdependent because at the moment we start to think we're reliant on China, then our foreign policy becomes nothing more, I think, than a sort of cascading series of concessions because we feel like we're the supplicant. Um, I probably should finish there. Okay, thank you. I can talk about a lot of other things another time. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. And now over to you, Melissa. Thank you, Bridie. Uh, well, like Richard, I'm also not part of the sector, but it could have been different. So when I finished my master's, uh, I moved, I'm a specialist in conflict resolution. So I was working in South Africa, immediate post-apartheid, looking at uh, some of the post-conflict work in Mozambique. And if I hadn't met a very untransportable Australian constitutional lawyer and come home, it could have been a very different thing for me. So, um, for the last 13 years, uh, I've been focused very much on Australia's diplomacy and foreign affairs, um, heading up the Australian Institute of International Affairs, the think tank that is linked with the Department of Foreign Affairs. Um, these days, I'm now at AsiaLink as Director of Diplomacy, and again, I'm focusing all the time on what's that diplomacy foreign affairs space. So, when I'm thinking about what that means for development, I'm coming from a diplomacy lens. On our topic, clarity or chaos. I'm gonna argue that we have both. We have chaos and, or I would probably call it geopolitical uncertainty or contestation, something like that. And what that's giving us at the moment in the diplomacy space is more clarity on the benefit of development cooperation. Paradoxically, more contestation is actually making a more positive environment for aid and development. Now, you're hearing that and you're thinking, oh my God, what was in this woman's guava juice at lunchtime? You know, have you noticed the last seven years, the last five years, what an environment we've been working in? Okay, and yes, I have. So the stats that Bridie was um, saying at the start, that comes from some research that we brought out this week, looking at just what a tough time it's been for aid and diplomacy. Um, so we are right now at our lowest point ever as a nation, investing in diplomacy, aid and trade. It's now 1.3% uh, for the period in which we've managed our own foreign affairs. That's a new low. Uh, we've had 1.6 billion cut just in the last five years. And if you want another, another lovely stat, um, if you think of all of the cuts the government has made over the last five years, 25% of those cuts have fallen on one department, on the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. So that gives you a sense of just what a cut it's been. So it's been a difficult environment, it's been a hostile environment. But my glimmer of hope is that maybe it's not as bad as we think going forward. Because if we want to make it, 
and that's again a question that you all have to decide yourself. There are arguments at the moment that fit development work very well into the broader foreign policy goals. Okay. So Richard's talked a little bit about the wider context of, con of, of contestation, what is happening, um, and what that potentially means as opportunities. Uh, I would say it really is a new era. Um, I'm one of those people, I'm, I'm very, uh, uh, very suspicious when someone says, oh, this is the worst threat ever, this is the biggest thing we've ever faced. I'm like, yeah. Well, probably not, actually. We tend, as individuals, to think that we live in uniquely challenging times, and it's not true. But for Australia, this is new. For all of our history, we have had um, an environment in which our region was, uh, what would you say, dominated by our great and powerful friend. Okay? And that's what we used to in foreign policy. We used to, whether it's Britain, whether it's the US, having a great and powerful friend in the region who we work with, that's our operating system. Not having that anymore taps into a really deep concern for foreign policy people. Um, Alan Gingell talks about it in his book as fear of abandonment. Um, and I think it's a, it's a great phrase to get that across. So you have people like Hugh White asking questions like, can we actually defend ourselves without the great and powerful friend? And you know, if you haven't read the book, the answer is eh, not so sure at the moment. So at some point, um, I think this, this has to, at some point, uh, turn into you know, increased focus and increased funds, not what we have at the moment, which is the magical thinking where our um, leaders tell us how difficult the world is, but then don't actually put the funds in to help us deal with how difficult the world is. Okay. Um, how you engage with this, I think, in the development sector probably takes you back to the why. You know, why do you do development work? And if I'm guessing, I'm guessing most of the people in this room will probably have some sense of the normative reasons. You know, there's moral arguments, there's humanitarianism, there's spirituality, there's solidarity, there's a sense of obligation, perhaps even guilt, there's senses of human rights, okay? So there's all sorts of reasons why we do development that are in that range. There's other reasons we might do development which are basically instrumental, okay? So they're about aid as a tool of statecraft. They're saying, Aid gives us influence and access. It gives us soft power. It helps shape perceptions in places that we wish to. It helps us directly in markets for Australian goods and services. Um, it potentially gives us some prestige, um, you know, shows ourselves to be wealthy and generous. And particularly in the current climate, it has geopolitical ends. It helps us build blocks if we want to, or potentially, disrupt the building of blocks by others, okay? So there's a whole argument there at the moment around aid as a tool of something that we want. Now, often that gets talked about as, you know, national interest broadly, and it's worth drilling down a little bit on what is meant when people talk about national interest. So if you look at something like the Foreign Policy White Paper um, released at the end of 2018, uh, it states our national interest in fairly simple terms, but it's around having an Indo-Pacific, you know, our, the region we live in, our broader region, um, which, where we're promoting prosperity and security, and where we have some commitment to solving global challenges. Um, and of course, development helps these. You can absolutely talk about how development helps with prosperity in the Indo-Pacific, about how development helps with security in the Indo-Pacific, and how it helps us deal with global challenges that might affect Australia's interests. Uh, I, was, I was struck when the Minister for International Development in the Pacific, Alex Hawke, was speaking at the AAA National Conference uh, last week. His words, and I'll quote them exactly, were that the Morrison government will continue to maintain ruthless and pragmatic focus on our national interest. Okay? And so that's the wording that our Minister for International Development and the Pacific is using. Now, let me give you an example of what that means in practice, okay? And I'll give you a word that diplomats are using and you're using, but I suspect you have no idea you're using them differently. Okay, so resilience. I'm guessing a lot of us in the room think about resilience, you know, maybe post-disaster, there may be all sorts of other sorts of resilience. Okay, when diplomats at the moment are talking about resilience, 
they're talking about helping countries build up their ability to withstand external pressure. Okay. So if you say something like, uh, the step up in the Pacific will build resilience in the region, you're saying it will help countries in the region withstand external pressure, by which we mean Chinese pressure. Yep. Very specific. Now, I'm guessing precisely zero people in this room got into their current jobs so that they could counter Chinese influence, but you may, if you choose to, decide to talk about what you do in ways that explain how it helps individual countries maintain their resilience, their independence, in the face of external pressure. And that, as I say, would fit in with these broader aims. Um, I think how you engage with this, to some extent, it, it depends a bit, you know, how much you care about what you're getting done versus what was the motivation, you know? Um, it may be that you really just don't want to talk, talk in those terms at, at all. But if you've got a project that you really think is worth doing for all of the normative reasons I discussed, but you can bring it within a foreign policy goal, which will get support and funding, there are ways that you can discuss that. And I'll just finish, I'm conscious I'm, I'm just on time, um, with another perspective on it. And it really came to me in the last session. Um, one of the things I know everyone in this room thinks about a lot is, is power, power relationships and our relationships with the countries we call recipients or thought of as recipients, and I'm sure we don't say that anymore. Um, the period of geopolitical contestation actually moves more power there, okay? And we know that from looking, say, at the Cold War. If there's a competition for who gets influence, if a small country in the Pacific gets to play off large powers against another and get the best possible deal for itself, it actually puts it in a much stronger position. There are more options, there are more choices, potentially more money and potentially less dependence. So while we may bemoan some of the geopolitical contestation, there are also some elements that I think are very interesting for us to consider. Thank you very much. Thank you, Melissa. And now, Anthea. Thank you, everyone, and good afternoon. Amidst the contestation and geopolitical tensions that we've been discussing today, Development Cooperation and the SDGs offer a means of constructive engagement and influence with China, but also with other influential powers in the region, like India. The contemporary narrative and practice of development cooperation is being shaped by a rising Asia and Asian-led South-South cooperation. And China is really at the forefront of this evolution. And the apparent normative shift, while possibly challenging, offers many opportunities for cooperation and collaboration. As we've heard, development is being more explicitly driven by foreign policy. And this narrative is coming as much from the DAC countries as it is from China. China and other countries like India and others have never made a distinction between aid and foreign policy. But Western countries previously tried to sanctify aid. But those days are over as we increasingly look to beyond aid solutions to global challenges. China's narrative is articulated through the Belt and Road Initiative. China has been building stuff and training people all over the world for decades, but until the BRI, the dots weren't explicitly connected. The Belt and Road Initiative scale and connectivity make it visionary and potentially transformational. To some, it's also threatening geopolitically, especially when China's relations with the US, with Australia, with Canada are already tense due to trade wars, accusations of spying, arrests, cybersecurity. 
As a result, we have a dominant foreign policy narrative that's very much about containing China, creating a rules-based order. And the development discourse is changing as a result and adopting securitized language like coercive capital, sharp power, and containment. The narrative reads a little like this. BRI is a Chinese imperialist strategy where Beijing's primary goal is to accumulate political and economic leverage created by Chinese-funded projects. China is accruing benefits such as finding more work for Chinese state-owned enterprises, exporting China's excess industrial capacity, expanding markets for Chinese goods, boosting internationalization of the RMB, and in doing so, it's creating unsustainable debt, fueling corruption, and threatening democracy. This probably sounds familiar to you. The narrative is hostile, hawkish, and competitive. And it increasingly drowns out the more moderative narratives that are out there. So where can we find space within this adversarial context for collaborative development and effective resource allocation? One option that's currently pursued is to get in on the infrastructure game uh, with China, along China, opposed to China. Infrastructure is back in fashion for many donors. And there are more and more connectivity schemes out there. We've been talking a little bit about those today, and these are some of them that are on the screen behind me. On a positive note, there is plenty of room for more infrastructure financing. There's a huge infrastructure gap in the in the world and in the region in particular. And there's also a lot of scope for more learning and collaborating. Competition and choice is also good for partners. The worry is that the motivation behind some of these new initiatives in particular is to contain and counter China's increasing footprint rather than to really respond to the needs of the countries and the region. We've heard today the Pacific Islands have a lot more suitors. Uh, after having been overlooked for decades, there's a lot more actors in the region. A second area is around engaging multilaterally. Chine China is an advocate of multilateralism and is highly committed to the SDGs. China is a major supporter of the UN financially with human resources and policy inputs. I think China is the second largest contributor to the UN's general budget. They've also demonstrated leadership on the SDGs within platforms like the G20. The Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank has become a vehicle for increased collaboration amongst previously unlike-minded partners and now has 100 members. On the business side of things, China's getting serious about economic, social, and governance standards. The Shanghai and Shenzhen stock exchanges, for example, have now joined the UN's Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative. These platforms and these institutions provide opportunities for discussion, for debate, for influencing, and for rule setting amongst members. China's multilateralism is also quite strategic. While it participates in, ex in existing institutions, it also creates new ones which are both purposeful, for example, the Belt and Road Initiative Energy Partnership or the AIB, they're also norm shaping. And this is a significant feature of 21st century multilateralism. As the US retreats from multilateralism, China, India, and others have stepped in and stepped up with the resources and influence to reshape the norms and practice of global governance. Another area where we can work with China is around regional architecture. ASEAN, for example, has not traditionally played a major role in development assistance. However, increasing geopolitical competition in Southeast Asia and the expansion of large-scale regional development initiatives like the BRI is prompting new thinking about ASEAN's role in development. Strengthening ASEAN regional architecture could allow the smaller states in the region to shape the terms of engagement for external actors promoting development financing to the region including on infrastructure, on connectivity, and other regional development initiatives. The Asia Foundation is doing a lot of work in this area. And, and this point also applies to the Pacific Islands Forum as well. <laughs> 
Triangular cooperation is another area that could be expanded. Previously, triangular cooperation was seen as cumbersome and questionably effective. But it now provides an avenue for traditional donors to engage and possibly influence rising aging contributors and to stay relevant in partner countries where traditional aid is diminishing in value and impact. For example, Australia has found useful common ground and results tackling malaria with China in Papua New Guinea. And there are numerous other examples from other donors as well. Lastly, around sharing knowledge and experience. In, develop cooper in development cooperation, China, including all its partners, research institute, government agencies, China is interested to learn from the rest of the world. There are abundant opportunities for knowledge sharing and exchange with China on issues like gender, humanitarian assistance, community engagement, country analysis, monitoring and evaluation. Last year, China established the China International Development Cooperation Agency, and it's a vice ministerial agency independent of the Ministry of Commerce and the Ministry of Finance, and it has responsibility for development oversight, for policy, uh, for monitoring budgets. SIDCA, as it's called, wants to learn from others in how to administer and manage its aid programs. So while it might seem like in this new world order, with China figuratively and literally bulldozing its way across the world, the alternate or other scenario is to build improved ties and understanding with Asian providers, exploit the space and opportunities that development cooperation and multilateralism offer, and by doing so, leverage each other's comparative strengths and influence in the region. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much. This one? Can we get this mic turned on, please? Yep. Thank you very much, Anthea. Move to this side of the, uh, the room so that I can see the audience and we'll shift into our question and answer series. Um, Richard, actually, my first question is for you on this issue of, of it being a time of contestation. Um, we've seen many foreign policy commentators uh, made their name on describing their era as a time of unprecedented change. And every three to five years, we have some white paper or other describing our times as, as fluid and uncertain. Um, are our times right now genuinely unprecedented, or is it just the pathways ahead are, are a little less clear? Um, well, you know, you can always use any kind of word, particularly unprecedented, to exaggerate if you like. Um, but I would say it's unprecedented enough. It's big enough. It's a big enough change. Uh, but, you know, post-war era, Pax Americana, uh, can that be replaced by a Pax Sinica? Uh, what happens if the US and China cannot get on? Uh, what does China want? Do they want to displace the US from Asia, or do they want coexistence? What does the US want? Um, I think it's very difficult, and I think it's, uh, if you look at, the, in North Asia, Southeast Asia, um, the, the idea, for example, that China can simply replace the US as the hegemon in the region, I think is quite far-fetched. Think about it this way. China has territorial disputes, either maritime territorial disputes, or territorial, you know, land disputes with South Korea, Japan, Indonesia, the Philippines, Malaysia, Brunei, Vietnam. Uh, the US has none of them. So the idea that China can be a sort of benign hegemon, uh, in relatively speaking, I'm sure some people would disagree with me, but that relatively speaking, the US has been or is, uh, it's difficult because they have to sort out their bilateral relationships with all these other countries when you have all sorts of things, including mineral resources at stake. Uh, what does China want? Do, I think they want to be the most dominant country in the region. As I said, that's quite unsurprising in the history of geopolitics. But what do they want with the US? That the US simply sort of, uh, you know, goes into a kind of bourgeois decline and disappears gradually across the Pacific. We all know from the British Empire, as they say, there's a lot of ruin in a country you know, the American power can take many decades to unravel. And I think in that time, particularly, I think Taiwan is the big issue in this respect. Uh, 
uh, how that is resolved or not resolved. Uh, there's ample opportunity for conflict. And in that respect, I think it's you know, unprecedented enough for us to worry about. Thank you. Responses from other panelists on that question? Yes, look, I absolutely agree. I think, for, for Australia at least, this is unprecedented. I mean, if you think of us as a country that only had a history from uh, a Western history, from the high watermark, from the high watermark of British imperialism to now, this is unprecedented in the time that we have been a Western country in the world. We might move on to um, the issue of, of aid and the national interest, and, and Melissa, we might stay with you on that. Um, your, your remarks were, uh, were, I guess, remarkable for us to hear um, about how we may want to speak differently about um, our business and, and how it fits with foreign policy. But national interest is, is often a dirty word in aid circles. It's synonymous with self-interest, um, the antithesis of, I think, why many of us joined and worked in the sector. So how can the, de the development cooperation program, I guess, walk and chew gum at the same time? Um, or are we kidding ourselves? Look, I think you can. The question is, do you want to? Okay. And I can completely understand if your answer to it is no. My reason is altruistic and I'm not interested in making these arguments. So I'm really giving ways that you can bridge that gap if you decide to. Uh, and I, I, I'm quite certain right at this moment that the arguments that, were, that are trying to come from a place of, of obligation, um, of rights, are not going to be as successful in this current advocacy environment as the ones that talk about what's in it for Australia. Okay. And, and that's come across very strongly. You know, the government has said, this is what motivates us. Um, in uh, the Prime Minister's Lowy speech, for example, a couple of weeks ago, it was very clear that foreign policy has to work for the quiet Australians. It has to be helping our economy and our jobs, etc. Okay. I think what you have to do is extend that idea of what's in our interest to encompass the interests of those around us. So to say, for example, uh, we have an interest in not having pandemics come to our shores. Therefore, we have an interest in the health systems and the viability of the countries around us. Okay? Now, if the result is that we're putting more money and effort into strengthening health systems, that may be okay. Uh, and I think it's just bringing that argument back home um, that this is going to assist in the stability and prosperity of the region, which is therefore going to help Australia. Thank you. Anthea, you've, you've travelled the world. I'm sure that this debate around aid development and national interest is, is not new. Do you have things to add from, from other countries that you've visited? From the perspective of South-South cooperation, if you look at India, China or other countries from the Global South, aid, uh, aid isn't really a term that they use. So cooperation, South-South cooperation has always been about mutual interest. It's a fundamental principle. Uh, mutual interest, reciprocity, win-win. Uh, so national interest is, is, of course, part of that. Uh, the challenge, uh, the good thing about linking development assistance to national interest is that it helps in a time of scarcity when, when other resources besides aid are really needed to address, uh, address the SDGs. Pitching it from a national interest perspective helps to mobilize other resources from the private sector. Um, they can see some, some benefit from themselves, and those, those, those resources are critical. Uh, the challenge is the SDG agenda, the leave no one behind agenda, and that's where I think the role of civil society is, is really very, very important to keep reminding us of what those critical issues are, who those constituent groups that aren't being reached by a kind of national interest agenda. But from a South-South cooperation perspective, it's always been there. It's just been part and package uh, from the start. It's never been about altruism. So the, the philosophy is different. I wonder, panelists, if you may have any questions for each other after, uh, after having the opportunity to, to listen to each of the presentations. If it happens to be my hand at the time, I will, I will go first. Um, I suppose I, I'd be interested from both panellists, from Richard and Anthea, on uh, how China is seeing its, as it would put it, South-South cooperation, its infrastructure investment through things like Belt and Road. 
how concerned is China about some of the issues that uh, Western development people have looked at a long time? You know, are we creating debt traps? Are we, um, uh, you know, building white elephants? Um, are we setting up anti-Chinese sentiment through shipping in Chinese workers and displacing local workers. How much is China actually thinking about that at the sort of local level, at the pushback level, rather than at the big geostrategic, we will build the Belt and Road and it will make the world sinocentric? Go ahead. <laughs> okay, I'll go. Yeah. Um. Well, Belt and Road is a funny beast, right? You know, if you, you know, Belt and Road, the Belt is the uh, development path across Eurasia to Europe. Uh, the road, counterintuitively, is the maritime path across the seas to Europe as well. Um, uh, but if you look at, you follow the Belt and Road these days, the Belt and Road has multiple detours. Uh, goes through Argentina one day, back down through New Zealand, through the Solomon Islands recently. Uh, all over the place. It's become an all sort of purpose brand for um, uh, Chinese uh, assisted development. Um, uh, we also shouldn't forget with Belt and Road that there's been a lot of Western criticism of Belt and Road, some of it justified, some of it not justified. Uh, but we missed the debate inside China itself, which also amongst the technocratic elite has been highly critical of Belt and Road because many of them think it's a waste of money. Uh, many of them think, think it hurts China's geopolitical reputation, if you like. Uh, China being China, which has multiple actors at the central government level, the provincial government level, the city level, SOEs and the like. Uh, many of them use Belt and Road as a great signal for themselves to go off overseas, which in, in many ways don't always reflect on uh, well on the centre. Uh, so the Western criticism of the Belt and Road has been used by its critics inside China to wind it back, which is what you saw happen with the conference uh, in Beijing in April this year. Uh, they're drawing down or spending a lot less on it. Um, so I think China is highly attentive to uh, how it's seen and whether it's working and they're trying to get this uh, under control now. I think China is also on the issue of... Um, uh, developing countries, being a developing country generally. Um, if you look at the WTO, China has developing country status. Uh, if you talk to the technocrats on this issue, that doesn't make much difference in the WTO, but China guards that status very uh, jealously. They, why do they do that? I think they do it for a number of reasons. It helps them in other forums. For example, uh, uh, climate change talks, they get a different deal if they're a developing country. But I also think China wants to be the leader of developing countries uh, as well. Um, so that's an important um, uh, issue to think about. Uh, on debt trap diplomacy generally, I would defer to my colleagues at the Lowy Institute who had a report out yesterday about this very issue in the Pacific. And I think there's no doubt that in some cases it's worked out like that. But I certainly don't think the, the centre in Beijing sets out to set up you know, a series of cascading debt trap diplomacies uh, around the region because they know that's not uh, sustainable. And finally, uh, all of these countries which have Chinese investment and aid, I think, have a great deal of agency themselves. Pacific countries uh, guard their sovereignty very jealously. Look how Malaysia was able to negotiate a better BRI deal. Thailand did. Pakistan did. Uh, so China can't simply get its way at will. Yeah, I would agree with uh, everything you said, Richard. China is very aware of these issues. It knows where its weak spots are. Uh, it knows where it has to learn more. Um, they very recently, uh, China published uh, a document called Debt, Sustain a debt, De debt Sustainability Framework for the BRI. It shows that they're thinking about debt sustainability issues. It's also important to note on the debt issue that, that uh, China and the IMF look at debt very differently. So China, given its own experience with debt, uh, and economic growth. It feels countries can handle uh, a higher debt ratio in the short term if the prospects, prospects for economic gain are sound over the long term. So they approach it a little bit differently. 
In terms of workers, Chinese labor is getting more expensive. So you see fewer and fewer workers being exported to countries to build infrastructure and more and more employment of domestic labor in, in many countries. Where China does have quite a weakness is around uh, community, community engagement and community accountability. And the reason for that is because in China, uh, they're very, very used to working through government. So the central government works with local government, and that's how decisions are made and programs are implemented. When they go into partner countries uh, where they need to engage with community, and there's definitely been pushback from communities around um, several Belt and Road initiative projects, the one in Pakistan, for example, where there's been land disputes and people have not been consulted, then they run into an issue of how, how to deal with this, because it's not something that they're used to doing. So this is an area of um, co potential cooperation with China, how to work more effectively with communities, how do Chinese companies work more effectively with communities, understand how to engage, how understand how to build complementary or develop complementary projects that support, support communities. Uh, this is a big area that the Asia Foundation works on as well. I have a question. So I'll, I'll have a question to two professionals in the sector. Um, the, uh, every morning I listen to uh, one of our Sydney's most famous or infamous shock jocks, Alan Jones, uh, to try and stay in touch with my country's id. Um, and the, uh, he's ranting every morning about foreign aid, saying we've got a drought, take that $1 billion now, give it to the farmers. Um, it's a perennially easy target. So I want you to expand a little more in this era of so-called quiet Australians. Um, uh, you know, how do you uh, make a public argument which can be persuasive in the tabloid press, press about the value of aid? I'll start with that one. Um, okay, well, first of all, I, I probably wouldn't say aid because that's straight off a bad way to situate the conversation. Um, I've been doing this a bit this week, talking about uh, our foreign affairs capacity broadly. So I'm putting together diplomacy, trade and, and development in that same bucket. Um, I think you can make the case and you just have to do it in a way that the Department of Foreign Affairs often hasn't felt it can, uh, but partly because it's, you know, these are non-elected officials and their job is to deliver things and they're not given much space or scope to go out there and make public arguments of this sort, but, you know, I can. Um, so I think your argument uh, has, to, has to make the connection between what our diplomacy, trade and aid does out there in the world and what the benefits are for Australia. So um, one way to make that real is to break it down to what do people actually do in these programs? So if I'm talking about uh, Australian diplomats, diplomacy, trade and aid, in uh, Indonesia, say, you know, a country which is of paramount importance to us on prosperity, on security, uh, going to be top five economy in a blink and a country where they don't need to care about us nearly as much as we need to care about them. We have to work hard. So what does a diplomat, an aid worker, in, in, um, in, in, do right now? Well, they might be out there uh, working on, um, on counter-terrorism cooperation. We have a centre to work with Indonesian law enforcement. You can make the argument clearly that the Australians who travel to Indonesia are safer because we do that. Okay. We do work on, uh, on people smuggling uh, with the barley process, for example. And again, you might say having regional cooperation to deal with people movements is a good thing for Australia rather than waiting until those hit our shores. Uh, you, people there will be working on consular cases, which is serious, you know. If you're thinking of Australians getting in trouble with law enforcement, that's a serious thing for them individually, and having people who can work on that matters. Um, if I'm thinking about things that are more strictly speaking on the aid side, you can talk about things like Australia Awards, where you're taking the people who are going to be the most influential people in Indonesia in the future, you're bringing them to Australia, they're getting an education, they're getting to see and understand our point of view, and we have access and influence. And, and you can keep going on. You can talk about the trade promotion side, how that helps Australian businesses, the investment promotion, how working with people overseas might turn into investors bringing jobs and factories here. Um, you can talk about what we do with the, um, the uh, Australia Global Alumni 
um, influential people in those countries and the way we maintain contact. So, you know, and that's before I go on to pandemics and, and, and all sorts of other things that, that uh, might make it real. But for me, it, it's all about saying, these are things that are good in themselves. The benefits flow back here as well. It's not pure altruism. It's because these things help us also. Now, I understand that's an instrumental argument, but that's how I make it. I might uh, take the opportunity at, at this point to pick up on something that, uh, that Richard, uh, you commented on whilst we were waiting to come on stage. And you said after around about 20 or 30 years overseas, you've, you've returned to this country and you've discovered that Aussies just aren't crash hot at communicating succinctly. And that really what we need to do is... is backstage, <laughs> backstage talk, I'm bringing it up here. Really what we, we need to do is, is get our dot points in order and deliver our key messages really clearly. And I think that's what you're getting at with your question. But I'd like to throw it back to you and to say to all of our panellists, you've sat here today, you've listened to our Pacific leaders, you've mingled with our guests here, if you were us, what would be the key messages that you would give a foreign minister who is contemplating the future of an Australian development cooperation program? And what would be the message that you would want to leave with us as a sector that plays our part there? Well, it's really not my field, so I'm being put on the spot here. Um, you know, you'd have to find some, you know, mutual assistance, something like that. Even that sounds a bit weighty. You know, I'd really have to uh, think about it, really. I'm just trying to think about ways you could drill it down. It has to be mutually beneficial. Uh, it's, you know, in the war on terror, you talked about a number of things like the Bali process in the so-called war on terror from 2001 and with the people smuggling... Uh, issue in Australia and then with uh, offshore processing and all that, that's all was fused into one sort of very effective talking point uh, by, you know, these days by Peter Dutton and everything, all the policy substance of the GATS seemed to, you know, you seem to be able to get money if you went through that funnel. These days you seem to be able to sort of build your programs by talking about China or the China threat and the like. Uh, and I think you've got to find a different way of doing it because that is, is probably not so sustainable. But as to how the, the right headline, uh, having uh, you know, um, complained uh, backstage <laughs> about the inarticulate society, I think coming from the US, they, in the US they teach people to speak to, and obviously that can be horrible self-promotion at times, but it's also about communication. And I think we don't do so well at that. Uh, you know, Australia has great soft power. We don't invest in it. Um, and you've certainly seen that in the Pacific and the like. Um, but I'm going to have to come back to your conference next year with a, uh, a communications package for you. Sounds like a deal. Melissa. Ooh, succinct is hard. Okay. Um, Minister, uh, Australia is in relative decline. Uh, we will never be as important in the world again as we are right now. We're being overtaken economically by the countries around us in the region. Um, with our lessening economic weight will come less power and influence. If you wish Australia to be an actor in this world rather than to just passively accept whatever the world throws at us, we have to make a much bigger investment in our ways of projecting to the world. And if we want to put that in, in specific terms, that means investing properly in our diplomacy, trade and aid, and making sure that we are actively promoting our influence in the region. Uh, I'm concerned that right now we have a mix of, I'd call it either a mix of arrogance and fatalism. So on the one side, uh, maybe we just think we're so important that we don't have to try that um, the rest of the world cares deeply about Australia and what we think and what we want and will somehow just fall into line. I don't think that's true. Or if it's on the other side, if it's fatalism, if it's saying that uh, we, there's nothing we can do, the world is as it is and we just might as well put up with it. That is, uh, that is not true and you can see from the long history of Australian middle power activism and our investments in the region, just what is possible. So we need to be active, engaged and invest 
if we wish to have influence in a time of declining power. Melissa, if things don't work out at AsiaLink, uh, come and have a chat to Mark and I. <laughs> Anthea, have a go. Um, I would, I would say that Australia really needs to be more collaborative and cooperative. I realise that's not the direction Australia is going, but given the size of the resources and that Australia is not a huge power in the region, you need to work with others. Um, so my message would be engage China, engage India, engage these other actors that want to step up in the region that at the moment have a multilateral collaborative approach. Um, seek triangular opportunities to leverage, leverage your limited resources. Share Australian good practice um, and lessons and look at what, where's your comparative advantage. Australia has so much expertise uh, and uh, trust in the Pacific Islands region. Work with others that are bringing in huge resources uh, like China in the Pacific, you know, establish a collaborative, not a confrontational uh, relationship in those areas and leverage your comparative advantage there. Well, I would like to thank the, the three panelists, Richard, Melissa and Anthea, for joining us today. They've traveled across oceans, outback and Sydney traffic to be here. Um, and it's been definitely greatly appreciated by all of us. To finish, I'd just like to make a brief remark about how ACFID is grappling with the clarity and chaos the panellists have d discussed today. And certainly communications of the aid program would be one of our number one issues, Richard. At ACFID, we do believe that Australia's development cooperation program can eliminate poverty and make the world a better place. And whilst doing that, it can contribute significantly to Australia's own interests. But we absolutely refuse to pretend that the complexity involved in doing that can remain some oversimplified policy one-liner. This year, you and ACFID have advocated strongly on our sector's number one policy platform, Ask, for a new development cooperation policy for Australia. A policy that makes it clear that the ODA's program's comparative advantage in international relations is its clarity of purpose, supporting the development aspirations of our partners, the people that we listened to this morning. And that if we get that development right, we can, we can walk and chew gum at the same time, reducing poverty and accruing long-term national interest benefit. But a program where Australian national interest alone is the master will ultimately undermine Australia's strategic interests, give rise to haphazard decision-making and resource allocation, and result in short-term plays at the cost of people's development, uh, sorry, at, at a cost to the people our development cooperation program is designed to serve. It would be a development cooperation program that had lost its way. Imagining the future of Australia's development cooperation policy is not going to be a debate which is just the domain of our sector alone. We can't navigate these waters alone. We will need to engage more with the people like who you've heard from today. And we need to think hard about, how, about the role development can play in our international footprint. So it's time for us to reimagine what an Australian development cooperation policy, performance and program framework would look like, a program we can all be collectively proud of. Ultimately, we want a pro-development foreign policy, not a foreign policy where development plays the poor cousin to its diplomatic and defence peers. So if you would like to continue this conversation, the discussion of clarity, chaos, contestation and the future of Australian aid, then please join us for the Talanoa coming up next um, on stage, uh, sorry, in the room in room eight. Um, Anthea and Melissa will be there with us to answer your questions directly. Thank you.